This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is William Damon. He is a professor of education at the Stanford Graduate School of Education, director of the Stanford Center on Adolescence, and a senior fellow at the Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's one of the world's leading researchers on the development of purpose in life and the author of the widely influential book, The Path to Purpose. Also, and this is really cool, in January 2018, Bill was named one of the 50 most influential psychologists in the world. Quite an honor. And for me, I'm honored that as a political science major with not great grades at all, who has put together some pretty cool investing books, but I feel honored and fortunate that I get to continue to learn every time I do this podcast and I get a chance to talk to brilliant men like William Damon. Think about it. Put yourself in my shoes. I just told you my academic chops. There's nothing to write home about. Absolutely nothing to write home about. I dialed it in. I got through an undergraduate and I got through an MBA. Key phrase, got through. Now, if I can figure out a way to find a purpose, and I got to tell you, this conversation with Bill forces anyone, including myself, absolutely 100%, forces me to rethink about the purpose, to carve that purpose a little cleaner on the edges. It forces that internal inventory, the internal inventory that we should all be doing every damn day. Because look, you could have all the money in the world. And don't get me wrong, I'm a capitalist. I'd like to have all the money in the world, but it's probably not going to happen like that. You can have all the money in the world. You can have all the fame in the world. I guess in one little narrow slice of the world, I have some fame. Amongst older guys that like trading books, why couldn't I get something cool for fame where like women between 25 and 35 are even more interested in me? That's the cool kind of fame, right? The classic Mick Jagger, Robert Plant fame. But I guess I will take my slice at fame right now because that little slice at fame gives me the chance and let's bring it back to the most important aspect of what you're about to hear that brings me back to william damon and purpose and if this conversation doesn't force you to think about your purpose on this planet right away go see a doctor or something go get a checkup something's wrong with you i hope you enjoy this conversation with william damon You know, Bill, I'm sitting here today preparing for this conversation, and I'm thinking to myself, where was Bill when I was in high school? Where was Bill when I was in college? Why did I not have this purpose perspective? Because as a man in my late 40s, I can look at your world, and I just, you just have those aha moments where there's a, a simplicity of what appears to be a common sense idea. There's a lot of data behind it, I know. But what is your purpose? What is our purpose? And my gosh, we just don't think about this, do we? People are beginning to think about it now, but you're right. It's been off the radar screen for too long. When people think about it, they have this, pretty much the same reaction that you do. Uh, that's why, that's part of the reason I think the idea has really caught on a lot. It's kind of amazing. I mean, we've, doing, we've been doing work on it now for about 10 years or so, and everything's changed. Now the word's all over the place, and we get zillions of phone calls and hear stories. There's research being done. I think there was a, a, need for the, a need for attention to this idea, for sure. Let me take you back in time, though. You mentioned 10 years, but your career obviously goes back farther than that. And I'm sure you were probably thinking about these issues early on before maybe it got codified into specific research directions. But start to lay the foundation, because this is not just something where you sat back and said, hey, I've got a great idea, and then just wrote some books. I mean, there's a lot of research here, and so you've got into the nitty-gritty of, 
of gathering data, the surveying, the, the looking at, uh, at individuals and how they act within families, et cetera. Why don't you speak to perhaps your triggers, your early triggers, even in the field of developmental psychology? Give me some feel for your start and what fascinated you to go this direction. There were outside influences, and there was the direction of my own work. One of the great outside influences was the Viennese psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl, who wrote a very powerful book translated into English as Man's Search for Meaning. The uh, original German title was actually Nevertheless Say Yes to Life. Frankl was really the world's first positive psychologist, I think. He wrote in the mid to late-ish 20th century. His great personal story was that he was thrown into a concentration camp during World War II and survived the experience by clinging on to his purpose of writing a manuscript, proposing a whole new approach to psychotherapy that he called logotherapy, which means meaning therapy. His basic idea was we're not determined by our past traumas or whatever our parents did to us when we were young or really any of the experiences that we've had in the past. Rather, we have control over our own fate by looking to the future and by developing purpose, developing something to live for, something to believe in. And he wrote that book, which uh, a lot of people read, but it never had much of an effect on the field of psychology for quite a while, even though a lot of people found it inspiring. At the same time, in my own development, uh, I was doing a lot of work on commitment, commitment of people to their work. For example, we, um, with some collaborators, uh, Howard Gardner and Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, we did a big project called Good Work, which was about how workers in any field, doctors, lawyers, journalists, businessmen and women, uh, educators, teachers, manual laborers, how, how people could become committed to the highest standards of their field, both excellence in terms of really doing a great job and ethics, doing the right thing. What I found, each of us, the three of us, uh, had our own insights about the work, as any three psychologists would, but my take on it was that what all of the good workers had in all of these fields was a really clear sense of the mission of their field, of what the field was about and what the public service was that the field was dedicated to. And that the mission is not hard to stay. Doctors, of course, are dedicated to healing people. Lawyers are dedicated to getting justice done for their clients. Business people, hopefully, are dedicated to producing services or goods that the world needs. But all of the people that we identified as good workers, really that that mission was front and center, and they were very articulate about how their work served that mission. I thought about this for a while, and I thought mission is an idea that has to do with a field. Medicine has the mission of healing people and so on. But what is the equivalent for individuals, for people living their lives in a psychological sense? And then I got back to thinking about Frankel's work and his, his great book, and I thought, well, this is purpose. Purpose is really the idea that drives individuals towards a good life, towards a successful life, towards a life worth living, a life of meaning, a life that's dedicated to something beyond the day-to-day -day survival and all of the self-protection and self-promotion that sometimes we get just totally obsessed with. But people that think beyond that, to the future, to the far horizons, to goals that they really throw themselves into, those are the people that are satisfied, that have a fulfilled life. And that concept, that master concept that gets you there, that gets you to understand that, is purpose. So that's how I got onto this, and we've been doing work 
uh, with people at really all ages. How do you help young people develop purpose? How can schools help promote purpose in students? And then as you get on in life, how can folks at an older age keep their purposes going, get purposes, find new purposes as they retire from their jobs or as their children move on and no longer need day-to-day attention? How can you then fill your life with a new purpose? We and other people have found that folks that have purpose are energetic, they're resilient, they tend to be highly motivated and, as I said, not so not so obsessed with themselves, but rather life and all of life's possibilities. Even gerontology has discovered the importance of purpose. Uh, as I understand it, gerontologists are believing now that purpose deters uh, morbidity and mortality even. People tend to be more vital uh, longer in life if they have purpose late in life. It is a fascinating topic because it's a topic, as I said from the very top, we're not having this dialogue on such a wide scale yet. I mean, we can find many books on Amazon, yours, of course, and many others. You mentioned Carol Dweck. And there's a lot of great writing out there, and a lot of people are consuming, and a lot of people are understanding these directions. But if we just blur our eyes and we look at, for example, something silly, it's not really silly, I guess, these days. It's pretty prevalent. The selfie, the use of social media, the short-term thinking, it seems like all of our cultural touchstones today, the things that we use the most, the things that we consume the most, the social media, the news, the media, et cetera, it's all about the moment, and there's there doesn't seem to be for especially young people. And I know that's one of your focuses, and I want we want to we'll start to unpack this. But for younger people today that are being bombarded with social media and apps, etc., growing up as a 15 year old today is quite different than perhaps, of course, a 15 year old in the 60s, 70s, 80s. I mean, they are facing a a level of information flow, a short term information flow that's unheard of, unimagined decades ago. Well, I think you're right. And I think we don't really understand yet what the consequences of that are going to be. I can tell you that There still are lots and lots of young people who are very well directed. They do find reasons to dedicate themselves to important things. It's not as if the world has changed so much that it's impossible for a young person to grow up on the right track. But I think you're right. There are a lot of distractions. It could be that at any time in history, there were always distractions. Uh, We don't really know because we can't go back 100 years or 200 years and really look around and interview young people then and see what they were thinking. But for sure, you have a point that's that's important, which is that in today's world, there are lots of short-term distractions and and also inducements to to worry about the wrong things. A lot of young people worry too much about getting into prestigious colleges, for example. That's something that is a great source of stress for a lot of young folks that we see. Bill, isn't that important? I mean, I'm talking to a professor at one of the finest universities in the world, you being at Stanford. Isn't that important, though? Aren't the prestigious universities, if you get in, doesn't that set you up for life, so to speak? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to say something to, 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 to surprise you, I think. For sure, a good education is important. There's no question about that. And I will say that a Stanford education is a good education, so I'm proud of my own institution. But I will also say that a good education is available at lots and lots of places, uh, including community colleges and state colleges. What's much more important than getting into a prestigious college is getting into a college that's a good match for your interests, for your comfort zone, for the kind of career and vocational interests that you have. And that is not by any means the colleges that rank high on all of the ratings for every young person. I advise young people to not worry so much about status and prestige because we see that 
the, the young people who are going to local colleges or community colleges that are working hard and doing a good job end up a lot better than some of the students who are going to the, the higher rank colleges but don't take it seriously or don't really invest themselves in it or aren't a, aren't a good match for the place. That's just another example of what you were actually talking about, which is people uh, who are getting distracted by the wrong goals status, prestige, these are not the kind of goals that are fulfilling in life or that will give you a good education. See, when you say that, though, when you say status and prestige are not fulfilling, and what you're really saying is kind of over the long run, maybe it feels good in the moment. I mean, if you're 30 years old and you make a million dollars off a of cryptocurrency, you're now pretty much at kind of God level if you didn't have that money. I mean, for your that moment, you're feeling pretty good, and you're and you're near the you're near Silicon Valley, so you've seen many personalities go from zero to sixty. But you're making a longer term case. Why don't you expand on that a little bit? Because you've already talked about kind of like what happens in older age, and there's a, there's a physiological element here that if you have that purpose, but. Just having all the money in the bank or being on the magazine cover, that's not, it looks good in the moment, but it's not necessarily going to, it's not going to carry you, is it? Well, there's, I mean, there's even pretty good data on it that the amount of money or amount of celebrity does not produce happiness. Uh, and I'm not taking a anti-materialistic position totally. I think it's fine for people to have aspirations and ambitions, and certainly you want to earn enough to support yourself and your family. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying nice things in life either. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a, a prude about this. But I can tell you that if that's all you have uh, is aspirations to acquire more and more and more glitzy things that is not likely to lead you to long-term authentic happiness. And there are so many cases of this and case studies and observations of people that are just miserable because they haven't found something more fulfilling in life and something beyond themselves. And that's really the main point about purpose is that you need to do something that's dedicated to something larger than yourself in life. Uh, otherwise, you're Otherwise, you will never have enough. You will never have enough to satisfy your materialistic impulses, ever. Uh, you'll always be grasping for more and more and more, and you'll always come up short. And you'll do a lot of worrying about yourself. And if you're dedicated to something more important, bigger, something that has to do with other people's benefits, your family, your customers, your the world, that gives you something to uh, really be proud of if you accomplish that. Let me take this to an early stage for young people. I can still think back to my high school days. I have certain memories that feel like they were yesterday. Maybe that's not necessarily true how they unfolded, but it feels like that sometimes. But let's talk about high school because, and you know, we can, we can use America as a jumping off point. What I would love for you to kind of elaborate on is the current state of the high school experience from your perspective. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? I mean, to me, it seems like the high school experience, I'm not so sure it's changed since I got out in the eighties, but it seems like it's all about, Hey, memorize this and then we're just we just mentioned then you will get into xyz school and then you will get xyz job and they never really tell you what happens after the xyz job maybe there's xyz family but the the purpose part why don't you speak to the high school experience right now and where we are in terms of bringing young people into the idea of purpose at that age the first thing i have to say is that you can't overgeneralize because there are a lot of different types of high schools out there. And there is a significant movement, uh, at least in the United States, that has produced a lot of charter schools or charter school networks or kind of semi-independent schools that are available not only to young people with significant means, but now are available to all young people. In other words, they're not charging a lot of tuition and, and things like that. And a lot of these charter school networks, uh, I'll mention just a couple, KIPP and Summit, they're, they're actually doing a, a great job at, at providing a curriculum that has meaning for young people, high standards, and they even uh, are aware of 
purpose and other character strengths that they pay attention to. There is a movement now that uh, is enlightened uh, at the high school level. Unfortunately, that movement has not transformed the entire landscape of especially public schools. One of the obstacles has been big government policies that have overemphasized standardized tests and the kinds of curricula that have no personal meaning to the students. The students don't even know why they're taking some of the courses uh, other than, and you mentioned this, other than to get the grades in order to get the degree, in order to get into college. But they're not even sure why they are going to college because they haven't, they haven't learned the excitement of being curious and finding out new things and even the importance of the skills for the jobs they want to uh, they want to get someday because people aren't teaching them this they're just teaching the curriculum in a very narrow way and so for a lot of high schools in our in our country uh, that uh, that have been uh, i think um dragged into this public agenda of increasing test scores, uh, I think that it's been a, a, a kind of a barren, uh, empty experience for a lot of students who then drift off and become unmotivated and never really learn very much. Uh, but as I say, there's there's reason to hope. There is has been, even in the last three, four, five years, a reaction against the policies that have created the deadly atmosphere in a lot of schools. And there have been a lot of new approaches that that are exciting uh, teachers and I think getting students more motivated. So it's a changing picture. It's a picture that I think there is some fresh thinking and there is reason to hope. But as you said, uh, there's also a lot of reason to regret that a lot of students have been wasting their time uh, during these precious educational years. I want to get into some examples where you can paint a picture for some of those fresh approaches where the audience that perhaps maybe have not yet seen your books can wrap their arms around something different, perhaps than their experience or perhaps than their, their kids went through. I want to go to there in a moment. But first, I'm a curious, something curious I'm thinking about here. You see so many, you've done so much work, you've studied so many people, you've seen so many young people. You see young people with purpose, you see young people without purpose, and there's all shades of gray in there. When you see that young person with purpose, can you always trace back to how that purpose developed? Was it family? Was it friends? Is there always a trigger? Or is there some element that it looks like there's a, uh, something innate in some kids that they just kind of wake up with the purpose? Or is it always a starting point where there's been a positive influence along the way, something that triggered them? It's more that. Uh, it's more that uh, there are some patterns that most of the young people we've seen who are purposeful have gone through. And they go through it in their own individual way, though. And I think that may be the part that uh, maybe that's what you are referring to when you're saying, well, is there something innate? Because no two young people do it in exactly the same way. But there are common patterns. And for example, uh, the young people we see who have found purpose usually have observed somebody in their life, some respected or admired uh, person who is a, a model of purposefulness. And it could be the parent, uh, it could be a teacher, it could be somebody who the young person has worked for in an internship, it could be a media person, somebody who the young person has read about or has seen on television. But there is somebody out there that the young person says, you know, this is the kind of life that I'd like to have. And it's not that the, it's not that the young person will do the same thing. Uh, I'll give you one quick example, um, just because it, stri it, it strikes in my memory so much because it was so, such an unusual context. Uh, it was a, uh, one of, uh, a, a young high school student who had a summer job working in a fast food restaurant, which is a very improbable place to find purpose. But he had a manager who 
noticed that this young boy didn't have a great attitude about his job. Uh, and so the manager said, you know, I want you to um, go outside where the customers are and really look at them and, and get a sense of who they are. And the boy did it. And then the manager said, you know, um, these are people who work hard. They come in with their families. This may be the high point of their day. Some of them have really hard lives. And your job is not just to flip hamburgers and put onions on the on the buns. It's to put a smile on those people's faces because they deserve that. That's the kind of that's the kind of uh, life that they've had that they that they really need that break. And that boy said he came away from that job just with a totally changed attitude about working. Now he was not going to go into the fast food business. He wasn't going to be a, a restaurateur, but he applied that message, the idea that you dedicate yourself to your work, you serve other people, you take satisfaction in that, you can really make a difference. You can, what you do matters to other people. And he applied that to his own life. Observing and having a mentor, or observing a model of purposefulness is a very powerful inducer of purpose for young people. And then there are a number of other things to the pattern, too. Uh, finding out, for example, what your particular gifts are, and maybe that is partly a little bit of the innate quality you mentioned. If your uh, purpose is to become, let's say, uh, gee, I don't know, a musician or something, or a singer, you would not necessarily want to make that into your vocation if you were tone deaf, let's say, uh, if you just didn't have that ability. So you you need to reflect on what your abilities are, what your interests are, what you get excited about, and what you believe in, what you, what difference you'd like to make in the world, what your contribution could be to make the world a better place. And so all of, when all of these things come together, observing a purposeful model, getting to know yourself, thinking about the world and what the world needs, that's when finally a young person can move forward and commit to a purpose. This can take a long time. Purpose is one of the later developing capacities that we find in youth. Uh, usually by age 20, everything has improved rapidly. But for most of the young people we see, they're just on the beginning of their journey towards purpose at that age. And when we're speaking about young people, support is often critical. I would like for you to go in this direction with parenting is that you can probably have many instances of very caring parents. They want to see their kids do the right thing, but almost every action of the parent doesn't support the child, the young person actually getting closer to purpose. In fact, they could do everything wrong. And I, I saw one example where you, you speak, it's like the idea of a parent, if a parent is going to work every day and the job is just about making money, and the parent is coming home and complaining and complaining, you know, that parent might want the best for their child, but the example is not helping the child either. Uh, that's that's right. Or, or, or then complaining for sure. Uh, but even not communicating well. Uh, some of the young people we interview, we ask them what their parents do, and they say, oh, well, um, dad types stuff into the computer all day. Uh, in his office. And we say, well, what does he type in or what does he do? And they don't know what the reason is. Uh, they don't know that he's, you know, somehow causing some food to be delivered to a restaurant or a medicine to be uh, produced or whatever the real purpose of the work is. And so the parent has not even bothered or had the opportunity to talk to the child about why, why, what I'm trying to accomplish in my job, why, why I go to work every day. And the other thing that parents do sometimes uh, that doesn't work out well in the long run is uh, try to write the script of life for the child, to try to actually give the child the purpose that the child is supposed to then dedicate himself or herself to. Uh, you know, the parent that says, well, we come from a family of lawyers. My grandfather was a lawyer. My father was a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. You're going to be a lawyer, too. 
and that doesn't really work out so well usually. Kids usually need to find their own purposes, and the parent's role is to discuss it with the child, give the child options, give the child support, the resources the child needs to pursue the child's own dreams, but directly giving the child the direction in life that the child is supposed to take uh, is not is is not usually a successful strategy uh, kids need to find their own interests in life if they're going to really commit to them you know i'm thinking of a a short video and i i hope i'm not saying a name that causes you any discomfort but there's an, uh, the eastern philosopher alan watts he has this short video that says uh, what if money was no object and he essentially paints the case exactly what you're saying which is like look find that find that direction, find that purpose that you want. And if you are fully immersed in it, fully embracing it, going that direction, you're going to find the other things you need in life to get through life, for example, like money, et cetera. You'll find if you go that direction that feels best to you and you really embrace it, there's going to be uh, an economic reward there if you go that direction. And, and that's usually true. I think you do have to be I mean, you'd have to inject some realism into it. The young person does need to get some feedback about whether the dream is actually realistic given what the young person is able to do. And I'll just give you an example of that. Is in, in every high school in the United States, there are usually a dozen or maybe more uh, uh, extremely talented kids who would love to go into theater or acting or directing or something like that. If you do the numbers, the, you know, a couple of dozen young people in, in I don't even know how many thousands of high schools, that would swamp the entertainment industry way beyond what uh, it could possibly handle. And, and not all of them are going to have the talent or even the luck or the opportunities to make it. At some point, there needs to be some testing of that dream. And it, it might well be that most of the, those young people are going to have to shift their ambition because it just isn't realistic and, fi and find another dream, find something else that they could do. And if they love theater, maybe they could teach theater or something like that. But uh, I think that uh, not all not all youthful dreams are realistic, uh, but I do agree with the idea that what should come first and foremost in your mind is what you believe in doing and and what you really can dedicate yourself to, and then give it a shot, try it out, put yourself into it, but then uh, then see what happens. And you may need to be flexible and shift course a little bit uh, because we don't always. Uh, uh, um, get exactly what we want uh, in life. Uh, sometimes you do have to make some, you, you have to make some adjustments. I'm curious, Bill, your career, uh, like a uh, very uh, accomplished in where the directions you've gone. Are there any aspects of your career uh, where your peers have pushed back in a way to say, well, gosh, Bill, I don't think that's the right direction, or have you found throughout your career it's been more about uncovering, uh, for all of us, aha moments where the vast majority of people go, gosh, that makes perfect sense, and Bill's done the research and the science is there, and it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I started doing the work on purpose, it wasn't really on the radar screen of at least rigorous scientific psychology or developmental science. Some people said, you know, you're getting into an area there that's almost spiritual, and this isn't the kind of thing that's ever going to fly with scientific journals. You'll never get funding. You'll never get research grants to support this work. Uh, it's it's just too out there. And that wasn't the first time that had ever happened to me either. How um, early in life did that happen for you? How did you know your purpose was to keep pushing through those obstacles? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. I would say I, I kind of have to speculate here a little bit because, I mean, who knows really when you're thinking of your own life. But I, I would say that for me, th there were some reasons that I had some confidence that I could do it because I know that I am – able to see the big picture. I mean, that's one of my gifts, and I'm able to write about things in a compelling way. So I always figured that if I could just, even even if I 
couldn't get a lot of support to do uh, big research projects, and uh, I, I failed to get grants. I, I always had the sense that it, I, if I could just get a few cases, I could write about it in a compelling way that would convince people. So that was part of it. I had some confidence in my own abilities, but I also know that I'm not very good at doing things that I'm not really interested in. If I uh, went down the other road and just tried to spend my career doing things that people said were safe and were already on the radar screen so that uh, it would be acceptable for people to do it, I kind of knew that that wouldn't work because I, I wouldn't do a very good job of that. I, I would lose interest and I wouldn't be very good at it anyway. So I didn't really have, I, I didn't see it as a choice. I saw, you know, I better give this a shot because it's Really, the only thing that makes sense, and I think I could do it. So I think it was it was something like that. And I also believe, just to say one more thing, when people say something like, "Well, purpose is more of a spiritual thing," or "It's it's out on the outer edges," or "The it's a little bit on the frontiers," I also believe deeply that that's how science progresses: is by taking a chance and doing bringing in something that hasn't really been looked at before because it's seen as being too remote or, or too hard to understand. And if you take a chance at doing that, that's how you really can make progress if you're able to make it work. You mentioned the pushback perhaps early in your career. I'm not asking for names, but was there was it a motivational? Did it did that necessarily motivate you with the pushback that's a really good question i and i think i think you you're picking up on something in a funny kind of way that yeah that um it does kind of tempt you to kind of go in the face of it uh and that's that is how i felt a little bit like sort of oh yeah you know they say i can't do it i'll show them or something it's there's a little sense of that Uh, i'm not by nature It's not necessarily rational to pick that direction either yeah exactly you know you can also make mistakes doing that and i'm not you know, by nature, a rebellious or contrarian person, but uh, there is a little, I think that that's a natural reaction that a lot of people have. And by the way, I see that in a lot of our young subjects, that when their parents challenge them about their dream or what they want to do, sometimes that little bit of resistance really gets the kid going. And so I think what you're picking up on is not just something about me, but it's a natural human tendency to up to a point to get charged up if somebody if you think you're on the right track and somebody is saying no 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 or go slow or don't don't tread in that don't tread there uh it, it's a natural human tendency to say oh yeah i i'm going to really give it a shot now i'm going to really really go for it i didn't plan this but you all of a sudden became a good case study for this subject i have one more question about you though because i think this would be useful for the audience just as one example look it's a small sample size just you but it's still interesting so you go down this path you you kind of have this this direction this feeling that you want to go you're doing your research Give me a window of time. How long from when you first had the, gosh, Bill, that's not a very wise direction, to where you really don't get that anymore? How much time passed? What was that window where you had to display internal endurance to get to where you wanted to go. And you were going to go that direction anyways. It was, I mean, clearly, I can see by the way you're thinking, you weren't, it wasn't like, you know, even if people never came to your side, you were probably still going to go that direction. But give me a, give me an idea of the time, how long you had to persist. Yeah, I, it, that's a good question. I, and I actually have thought about that. And I, I would say, this might sound like a long time, but I would say it, it's about four years before before people then come around and say, you know, you weren't just wasting your time, or this looks pretty interesting, or something like that. Uh, the skepticism lasted, uh, uh, you know, three, four, three-ish, four, four-ish years before I, I got some recognition that I was on the right track. And the reason I bring that up is because it could be less time, it could be more time, but generally, if you're going to go down this path of purpose and there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be people that say it's not done that way. And as you mentioned, science is about experimentation and trying new and taking chances. You, you can't expect it to be overnight. That get, that gets back to the short-term aspects that you have been fighting against. You're, you're right. I think you've, you said it very well. And, you know, as you're speaking, I'm even, I'm even thinking that, you know, it might even be... 
it might be, even be a sign that you're trying something that ought to be tried if you initially get this kind of blank look from people or this resistance or this advice not to go there uh, or that you'd be wasting your time if you go there. Uh, it, that might even be a good sign because it means you are onto something new. I mean, it doesn't always mean that. And the, sometimes those people might be right. And sometimes failure, you know, sometimes you take a direction and it doesn't work out and failure is part of it. And that's okay, too, because you keep going. So it doesn't always work out. But it could well be that skepticism uh, is a sign that maybe you're really onto something that people aren't aware of yet. Let me take it back to the young people uh, perspective and this great four-word mantra, you can do it. This is something that, I mean, we're, we're, we're going there in every part of this conversation, but the expressing to the young person, you can do it, you know, that positive affirmation, you can do it. That's huge, isn't it? I think those are the four most powerful and helpful words that a parent can say to a child. You just said those words, and uh, that is a wonderful, great message that parents can give to every child, and it's a true message because every child has something to contribute. Every child has a spark, and when the parents, and the parent is the most admired child, and the, I'm sorry, the parent is the most admired person in the young child's life, and to hear that from the parent, you can do it, is so moving and and helpful to the child. Why are parents scared to say that sometimes? I can't really answer that. I uh, I love that. I love I love the fact that I know your academic career, and I love the fact that I'm sitting here right now in Saigon, Vietnam, and I can't get an answer. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, sometimes it may just be that the parents aren't even aware that this would be helpful or that they should be saying it. Uh, but I don't. I don't know. I don't know. But you know, I would say I'm sympathetic with parents. It's it's not easy being a parent. Uh, parents have a lot of things on their mind. Uh, they have to keep the show going. You know, they have to, um, as we say, uh, bring home the bacon. You know, they have to keep food on the table. They have to keep a roof over the head uh, and take care of the child. And the, and the world is a tough place. They have hard things, sometimes health issues themselves. So parents uh, don't always have the luxury to uh, to have the attention span even to be thinking about every single thing that's the best for the child. They're they're doing the best they can, but uh, they're up against it too. So I'm very sympathetic with parents, and I know that parents, as a rule, most parents really love their children and would do anything for them. So there's there is work out there. There are people that go down certain paths, academics, uh, other people, and they they make a case that hey, this this particular child had a really rough upbringing. You know, really uh, traumatic things, you know, just parenting terrible, or perhaps there was uh, not enough money, not enough food, not enough everything in the household. That doesn't have to be a lifelong limitation. So for those people, and I see this sometimes in America where we do create, even though it might not be on purpose, we create what I, in my mind, look at as excuses. Now, they might be very, very good excuses, as I just mentioned those things. There's something we can look forward to if we can get past where we all start. We all start with something different. But if we can get past, for example, the child, uh, the young person that comes up in a very traumatic upbringing, there, is, there can be something positive on the other side. And it's literally just, is it almost, can it be a, a light switch flip? Can it be an aha moment to get them going in an entirely different direction? I think so, yes. I think, and you're on to something that really I think is the future of, of developmental psychology, actually, which is to turn things around from this old view that people used to have that began with Freud and so on, that we are determined by our early experience. And if we've had traumas, we're always going to have to be struggling and fighting with those, and we will be limited. The view that you've just mentioned is now being called prospective thinking. And it's the idea that we have the power and the ability to shape our own destiny by thinking to the future. And it is a kind of an aha revelation that even some of the difficult things you've been through give you an opportunity to develop strengths that you wouldn't have had if you hadn't had those challenges. Now, that doesn't mean forgetting the past. The past is 
always with us. It's important for people to own their pasts, and and there will be some limitations and that we've developed, but those limitations are not the end of the story. They don't determine our futures. In fact, the only thing that can determine our futures is ourselves, our own aspirations, our own determination, our own belief, our own sense of where to go. And purpose is a, a big part of that. The purposes we find in life and that we construct and that we develop are the road to a fulfilling future. And this was, by the way, this was the message that Frankel had when he was doing the writing. That's why he was such a visionary. And it's very much in keeping with the positive psychology movement, Marty Seligman's work, and the the best in current thinking in the field. Carol Dweck's work about growth mindset, that we always have the capacity to learn, to grow, and to invent our futures. I have one last, one last question to go into, kind of a big picture question. We could talk probably for hours uh, on this particular word, and I'm kind of going to combine it with the word that we've been using this entire conversation. So if I take purpose and I add moral to it, or we just examine the word moral, it's not a word that is, you know, you don't flip on uh, CNN or Fox or MSNBC and often hear the lead news story with the word moral. It seems like the word that we are running from uh, so much in modern society. Well, let's don't talk about that. That's completely different for everyone. It's just, it's just not talked about. Speak to moral. Speak to, is, is it a moral purpose? Speak to. You know, I think you, you probably have a decent feel for where I'm going. Right. Uh, and, and I think people, um, it, people hesitate to use it because it's, it sounds like too big a word, and it sounds almost controversial, like whose values uh, should we call moral. But I would rather think of it in a way that's more common sense, that's more universal. If if you just think about common decency, about being a decent person, being compassionate, being honest, the basic values that all people need to live a civilized life, to get along with each other, and to become trustworthy, to keep your word. If you think of moral in that way, and, and don't get into big ideological controversies or thinking of that as morality as being some heroic action that people have to take, but rather just the common decency that's needed to have good relations with the people you love, with your fellow citizens, to obey the laws in your society, and and to be somebody that people can count on to make a positive pro-social contribution to the world. And I think that is a very important part of purpose, moral in that sense. But and I would keep it at that level. That that if you if you think of it like that, if everybody would just behave that way, there would really be much less uh, problems in the world. It's right there at the foundation, as you mentioned at the beginning. Like, how does one get towards happiness? Moral, as you just defined, uh, talking purpose. This whole conversation. These are all. Huge keys to finding that happiness, huh? I think so. I think that, um, you know, if you have a life that you're proud of, that you feel comfortable with, that, uh, you look forward, you don't, you don't have to worry that you're doing something that's harmful to yourself or other people, that's the key. You can build on that all kinds of positive aspirations and, and that, that's what we see when, uh, and, and I, I will say the good news is that a lot of people, including young people, are finding ways to do that these days. The rest of us uh, are trying to learn from their examples. So I can highly recommend people to go check you out at Stanford, one of your more popular books, The Path to Purpose. And for those people that really want to dig into the data, perhaps they they think that we were being too general in this conversation, they can quickly go to your, your academic stop and, and find a lot of data, a lot of white papers. Is there a website we can send people to, Bill? Yes, it's, it's very simple. It's the Stanford Center on Adolescence, or Stanford COA. And if you just Google that, it will get you right to our website, and there's a big publications page with all of our work, all of our 
former students' work, all of our colleagues and collaborators, all of the most up-to-date data on purpose development. It's the Stanford Center on Adolescence, or Stanford COA. That's the website. You know, it's amazing these days that everybody has their niche, their specialty, their direction they've gone. But if you take a moment to kind of, and this has happened to me in this conversation with you, if I take a moment to blur my eyes and open up this this new door, and there's this whole group of people that have dedicated their lives to this direction. I find that, you know, doing this podcast, I find that so much. So it's awesome. I appreciate your work and great insights. Thank you for coming on. Well, thanks for the podcast and for all the good work you do. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.